actually the first of the principles is one that I'm not going to talk about now because we've got a, a whole session on it later in the course. And that's uh, what I call wild soil. So, uh, you know, we try to keep the soil as undisturbed as possible, as close as possible to its natural condition. We don't favour digging and ploughing. But we'll, Harry will come back to that later in the course. But for now, let's start by looking at diversity. You might just need I'd really rather use the blackboard, I think. I, I don't like this modern yeah. technology. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> diversity. So, I mean, you, you can see for a start that natural ecosystems tend to be much more diverse than cultivated systems. And, you know, we saw that in the comparison I made just there. Uh, you know, that's sort of an overall intuitive observation. But there are also some specific ways in which we can introduce diversity into our cultivated systems. And so, you know, if, if you just had random diversity in your garden or on your farm, it probably wouldn't be that advantageous because you might not put together things that worked well together. Um, so, how do you put things together? Thank you, Kerry. <laughs> they need to be different in some way or other. And there are two main ways in which they can be different. One is uh, in shape and the other is in time. So an example of shape, if you put together in your garden a mixture, a simple mixture, two plants, squash or pumpkin and sweet corn, in fact, that's exactly what we've got here on the picture. <laughs> um, I can talk, talk to the picture. Um, because one is tall and thin and the other is short and bushy, they don't compete very much for shade, for, for light. And neither of them can seriously cast shade on the other. And uh, they don't compete too much for space. And so you can get a much higher yield. What I tend to find when I do this in my garden, which I do pretty well, or have done uh, pretty well every year, is uh, get about 150% of the yield that I would get if I only grew one crop on its own. And uh, so, you know, I'll get 100% yield of the sweet corn and perhaps 50% yield of the squash. Um, something like that. So, you know, it's, it's a real increase in yield. A uh, well, couple of tips if you're going to do this. One is give them plenty of compost or manure because they're both quite heavy feeding plants and you've got two of them there. So, you know, you're going to need uh, uh, plenty of uh, plant nutrients. And the other one is make sure that the sweet corn gets well established before the squash takes over it. it, it it's quite a good idea to plant out the sweet corn perhaps as much as a couple of weeks before the, uh, the squash. Otherwise the squash just swamps it and it comes to nothing. Okay, so that's an example of shape. Now in terms of time, another simple mixture that can be grown in the garden is a mixture of cabbage and lettuce. Cabbage being a relatively slow growing crop, and here what I'm doing, I'm representing the situation at the beginning of the growing season, planted out your little cabbage plants, and you can plant out to your little lettuce plants in between them, and bit by bit the, the cabbage grows, but it grows slowly. And before it grows enough so that it occupies the space that it will eventually occupy when it's mature, you harvest the lettuce. And so you can get more yield out of this than if you only grew one of those plants on its own. Um, you're probably getting more yield of the, of the cabbage in this case than you are of the lettuce because you had to grow lettuce on its own, you would plant them much closer together. So you 
you're not likely to get 200%, but you're likely to get more than you would if you just glue one on its own. Adding more, more diversity, you get sort of diminishing returns. So there's usually a very big uh, advantage in combi combining two crops compared to growing just one. If you add a third one, it's a little bit of, a, uh, of an extra advantage. And fourth one, you know, and it, it is, is a bit less again, and so it goes on. So, uh, you know, the more complex mixtures, although there you know, might be very good reasons for growing them, they're, um, uh, it really, actually, that initial finding two things that really go well together. And another th thing you can do is to put things that are functionally similar or dissimilar. So, function. And the classic one of that is uh, mixing something which uses nitrogen with something that fixes nitrogen. So beans, for example, are a crop which have the ability to take nitrogen from the atmosphere, fix it in their roots, and then some of that nitrogen can become available to other plants which are growing in the same root space. So if you have a mixture of wheat and beans, uh, you will get... Oh, I can't remember what the figure figure is for that one but anyway you will get considerably I know yeah I remember you can get the same yield off 50 acres that you would have got off 60 acres if you'd grown the two side by side so that's like 120 percent of yield so that's the key to polyculture is to put things together which are different uh, I've been talking about the difference between different species of plants, there's also the difference between different varieties. Can anyone tell me the difference between a species and a variety? Like an apple would be a species, but two types of one, a green apple, Granny Smith versus a, what is this? Discovery. Yeah. <laughs> Discovery would be two varieties of an apple. That's right, that's right. Um, uh, apples are a species, variety, uh, sorry, discovery is a variety. And so a species is a group of organisms which can actually uh, mate together and produce fertile offspring. A variety is a subset of a species. And the reason why I'm, I'm going into this is because When one of the advantages of diversity is, of course, that the ecosystem is the agroecosystem, the farm, the garden, whatever, becomes more healthy. Because everyone knows if you've got a monoculture, very easy for diseases and pests to spread. Because most pests and diseases are quite specific, they will only attack certain plants. Now, pests tend to vary according to uh, different species. You know, a pest, uh, say, a uh, cabbage white butterfly will eat any kind of cabbage, any kind of brassica, it doesn't matter what, what kind it is. Whereas diseases tend to be influenced more by the variety. So you could have different varieties, you do have different varieties, which have di resistance to different strains of disease. And this is how uh, lettuce is grown on a commercial scale, organically. They actually, it, out in the field, you'll see there's a whole mixture of, of, of small blocks of different varieties of lettuce. Uh, in East Germany, before unification, they, um, they couldn't afford uh, to buy fungicides for their cereal crops, for their barley in particular, and so... They, you know, it's command economy, so they could, when somebody up top told them to do something, they all did it together. They stopped using fun, no, they, they started growing mixtures of barley varieties. They made perfectly good beer out of it, and the, their use of fungicides went down by 80%. Um, 
after reunification, the West German brewers wouldn't tolerate mixed varieties and they had to stop doing it, but it's another story. Uh, so that's uh, another important aspect of uh, diversity. Not only does it give you a high yield, it also gives you a, uh, a healthier system, which in turn leads to higher yield. Um, the disadvantage of it is that it's more complex. You know, if you're growing sort of thousand hectares of something, it was very easy to get on your tractor and just drive like hell all day. And so if everything's all the same, it's a lot easier. Um, but if you're working in a small home garden, having a mixture of sweet corn and squash, it's not a problem. So, oh, damn, that's the wet one. So an awful lot of the things that we talk about in permaculture actually work much better at a small scale than they do at a large scale. Uh, the next principle is what we call stacking. Now stacking is another kind of diversity, but it is specifically diversity where some plants are taller than others and the classic example is the forest garden where you have a tree layer of fruit trees and then you have a shrub layer of fruiting shrubs currants and raspberries and so forth and then you have a vegetable layer of perennial vegetables and ground cover plants um, so there you've got uh, those, th those three layers um, where you have a combination of a woody plant with a herbaceous plant. We call that agroforestry. By a woody plant, I mean a tree or a shrub, you know, something which, which has wood as part of its structure. So, a combination of, of wheat and walnut which is actually one that goes quite well together, that's an example of agroforestry. Whereas this combination here is not agroforestry because they're both herbaceous plants, they're both non-woody. Okay, agroforestry is quite an important aspect of permaculture. Mm -hmm.